This is Bucky Wild, and welcome to One Step Past, Action Heroes of History, John Paul Jones. He's a storied hero of American history, and an important one. However, he is mentioned very little in history classes, if at all. What are some things commonly known about John Paul Jones? He's called the father of the American Navy. His real name was John Paul, not John Paul Jones. He was born in Scotland, not America. And his famous quote is, I have not yet begun to fight. But there are some key points about John Paul Jones you may not know. He was a social climber, but also had problems with authority. He fled to America and changed his name to avoid prosecution for murder. Um, in his life, before he came to America, he was accused of murder not once but twice. Uh, he was not a solid good guy, loved by all. After the Revolutionary War, he served the Russian Navy. In his later years, he was in court for raping a 12-year-old girl. Although he was found innocent of this crime, Jones did admit to having sex with her. He died in Paris, France in 1792, and his body was not brought back to America until 1905. So, are you interested in this guy yet? Well, there's no time like the present to get started with the past. But before we jump right in, I want to make it clear what you should take away from this glimpse into the life of John Paul Jones. He should be remembered for his positive contributions to America. He could have been treated better by the American government. And he did have character flaws and wasn't the most honorable man. So, let's get started. Three, two, one... He was born in Scotland as John Paul on July 6, 1747. John came from a poor but large family with seven children. As an interesting side note, it has been questioned if John Paul Sr. was really John's father. Now, we won't get into that debate, but the legends of a person are often as important as the facts. John Paul Sr. was a gardener, so John didn't get the desire for sailing from him. Uh, it really doesn't appear like it was a tight-knit family, at least on the part of John Paul. John's father died when he was only 20, building a sailing career. Uh, John did seem to be somewhat close to, or at least fond of, his older brother William. William lived in Fredericksburg, Virginia with his wife and had a flourishing tailor shop. Now, like a lot of teenage boys in the Western world at that period, John had a calling for the sea and he started his maritime career at age 13 and this would be in the year 1760 uh, with his parents blessing he was an apprentice on a small merchant brig called friendship now it wasn't a big ship but it did have guns in case of pirates uh, there was a real risk of danger here and John's parents were cool with it now I don't know about you but would you allow your 13 year old son to be a sailor I mean you can see how John had to learn to be tough from an early age. John's voyages took him to Virginia on a yearly basis where he would go visit with brother William. Now during these visits, John became enamored with America. I think he just, he just liked the place, whether he just liked the place or the people or if it was something different, there was just something about it that just always kind of stayed with him. At age 16 in 1763, the friendship was sold and the entire crew was let go. So, but that didn't deter John at all. Uh, this was just what he was into, it's what he wanted to do. So the next thing he did was he became the third mate of the King George. Uh, King George was a slave ship and John served on this ship for two years. Now, he never liked the business of slavery from the start. But, you know, he was still a poor young man, and he was in need of work and wanted to sail. And he may really not have known much about slavery. Maybe somebody told him that, you know, hey, maybe it's not that bad. Or, But he got to see firsthand just how bad slavery really was. In 1766, he took a better paying position as first mate of two friends, another slave ship. This was a much more prosperous ship it was a better paying position however this lasted for just one voyage and john left two friends in 1768 while docked in jamaica 
he really, really hated what he called the abominable slave trade, and he never worked on another slaver. Uh, there were a lot of things he might have done for the money, but that was the line. So after that, John got a ride back home to Scotland on the brigantine John. This ship also became his next place of employment. Uh, at this point, it looked like John could do nothing to hurt his sailing career, and he kept advancing. Being hired on the John proved to be most fateful for all that was to come next in his life, good and bad. During the voyage, both the captain and first mate died of yellow fever. John had to sail the John back to her home port. Now, the John's grateful Scottish owners made John captain of the ship and its crew. And he also got 10% of the cargo. Now, this is not a bad gig for being just 21 at the time. At this point, I think it's important to paint a little picture of John Paul and his personality. For better or worse, it guided his actions for the rest of his life. So, what was he like? Captain Paul was never a big man. He was a slight and wiry little fellow, about 5 feet 5 inches tall. Don't let a small size fool you though, he was plenty tough and he had to be in his chosen profession. Uh, John Paul had sharper features. He was always neatly dressed. Uh, he was thought of as a dandy by some. He saw himself as a smooth gentleman type and had an eye for the ladies. So even centuries before there was James Bond, there was always guys trying to be James Bond. <laughs> now, John was a cocky sort, but he did have a sense of humor too, and he could be charming when he needed to be. However, he also had a quick to violence temper. There were things about John Paul Jones that were going to rub some people the wrong way, especially rough and tumble sailors. He was a very young captain too, which some people might not appreciate. Did he truly deserve his rank at that time? Who are we to say? What we do know is that despite being a fancy Dan, he could also be a roughneck and he did have some skills. You're also going to find that standouts and heroes of history are those people who are fired up to begin with. Calm, sedate people are generally not considered men of action. So now, back to our story. Captain Paul made two voyages with the John before trouble arose. What happened to John Paul in 1770 is very significant in the life of this complicated man. Up until this point, everything had been smooth sailing in his career. Good things would still come in his life, but it was peppered with a lot more bad things. In 1770, the ship's carpenter, Mungo Maxwell, made a demand about early payment of wages. In the process, Maxwell stirred up the other five members of the crew, and it was very clear that mutiny was going to take place. Uh, this is when Paul's legendary infamous temper led him to order the flogging of Maxwell with the cat of nine tails. Perhaps an older, more experienced captain would have handled the situation different. Maybe it didn't have to come to a flogging. Maybe it did. I, it's hard to say. But from the start, there were those calling John's actions unnecessarily cruel. But the authorities dismissed this until Maxwell died a few weeks later. As it turned out, Mungo Maxwell was not a usual sailor, but a rich kid from a wealthy and influential Scottish family. Mungo fancied himself an adventurer. Uh, being paid early probably didn't mean much to him, and he more than likely just wanted to get in John Paul's face. However, throughout time, a lot of rich people don't like to feel retribution, <laughs> so Mungo's dad wanted to come down hard on John Paul. John was arrested and imprisoned in his homeland, in Scotland, uh, later to be released on bail. Evidence was found to acquit John Paul. Maxwell worked on another ship after the John, and that ship's captain claimed that Maxwell was in perfect health at the time he started. Mungo Maxwell's cause of death was found to be from yellow fever and not from his flogging wounds. However, the damage to John Paul's reputation was permanent, and this incident dogged him for the rest of his life. John's time on the John was done. So how do you think he felt about that? He had been chased away more or less from his homeland. 
His shining reputation had been forever tarnished. Plus, he really got to see how wealth and influence ruled everything. Shortly after this, John was accepted into the Masons. It was clear that he felt it was important to make powerful connections. Whether his decision to join the Masons was prompted by this upsetting affair is not certain. It is something that would be of great value to him a few years later. What we do know is that losing his job might have been harder on John Paul had a better one not come along. In 1772, John became the captain of the Betsy upon the full recommendations of the John's owners. The Betsy was a London registered vessel. It was a bigger ship, still a merchant vessel, but with the mission to do commercial speculation in Tobago for 18 months. Now, as a little aside here, Tobago is tied to Trinidad. It's a tiny little island in the Caribbean that is close to the continent of South America. If you think this new job put any distance between John Paul and controversy, think again. On the first and only voyage Captain Paul made on the Betsy while in Tobago, he killed a mutinous crew member named Blackton in self-defense. Now, once again, it was over a pay issue. Blackton had some of the crew stirred up for mutiny, but that ended when John Paul ran him through with his sword. Blackton was a much bigger man than Paul and had a club. John's options were limited in this situation. Captain Paul fled to America because he knew he wasn't going to have a fair hearing. John Paul wasn't wrong. <laughs> Blackton was a native of Tobago, so that was working against John's favor. Even worse, John knew that he was going to be tried in an admiral's court where Mungo Maxwell's father was still influential. This wasn't good times for John Paul. He had made a fortune for himself with his new job and had to leave it behind. Not only that, but he knew that his sailing career, at least in Europe, was totally done. It, and then along came Jones. <laughs> Why Jones? When Jones? No one really knows for sure, and guesses abound. We know why John Paul had to change his name, but when exactly did he do it, and why Jones? Some people believe he changed his name to John Jones just to escape Tobago, and later changed it to John Paul Jones. Another belief is that John Paul didn't even change his name until after he got to America. He saw the name of John Jones on a headstone 30 feet from his brother's grave, and thought it worked. Another story is that Jones was the name of the bondsman who helped out John Paul after his brother's death. A popular belief, however, is that John Paul added the surname of Jones to honor Willie Jones of Halifax, North Carolina. Willie Jones was a planter and a statesman that later served on the Continental Congress in 1780. Willie Jones was a popular guy, so it would have been to John Paul's benefit to attach himself to someone well-liked. It's also unclear if the two men were somehow distantly related. The reality of it is that he could have just picked Jones as a quickie alias like Smith. Whatever the case may be, the world will always know him best as John Paul Jones. Why America? It's never been officially determined why John emigrated to America. He could have gone anywhere. There may have been a number of factors why he chose America. His brother William was in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Or was John really that taken with the American spirit? Maybe he was simply trying to rebuild his fortune and thought America was the best shot. One thing we do know is that John Paul Jones became very fond of America while he was here. They say timing is everything. 1773 to 75. Much of this period of John Paul's life is very sketchy. Uh, what I mean by that is that we just don't really know everything that happened. We know that he wasn't totally inactive. He was doing something during this period, but it just seems like that his life was pretty well documented before this point and very well documented after this point because of everything that he did in the Revolutionary War in his later years. But during this time, it's like we don't know it what was going on with him. Not entirely. He lived in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Uh, brother William died sometime during this period and John handled his affairs. 
William had no children or other immediate family. Uh, William's house has since been called the John Paul Jones House, although it is not the only house by that name in America. How did John make a living? Did he work as a tailor? A farmer? What did he do for money? Uh, we know that he was really trying to network and build strong associations with influential people. He was working his angle as a mason. Uh, he was also elected to the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia in 1774. Since he would not move to Philadelphia until 1775, it is obvious that he was always planning to move there since he came to America. Uh, he was always trying to get himself in line with rich, powerful men. That we know for sure, and it ultimately did work for him. Um, at the same time this was going on, tensions between England and the American colonists were at a fever pitch. You can look at John Paul Jones' take on the situation in one of two ways. It can be believed that John really sided with the colonists and wanted to do his part to fight England. Or you can believe that he was just an opportunist, didn't care what the cause was about, and just wanted to take advantage of the situation for his own benefit. <laughs> Maybe it was a combination of the two. What we do know is that Navy life would agree with him. Uh, he was a fighter, and this career filled a void in his life that he had been missing. The battles of Lexington and Concord in Massachusetts marked the beginning of the Revolutionary War. It wasn't long after this that John Paul Jones went to Philadelphia to offer his services to the newly founded Continental Navy. Officers and captains were in great demand. It wasn't what he knew, but who he knew that got him a position as first lieutenant straight away. Jones's connections had worked for him. His main endorser was Richard Henry Lee, a statesman and founding father from Virginia who attested to his abilities. There were also other members of the Continental Congress who backed Jones and got him appointed as first lieutenant of the USS Alfred on December 7, 1775. This is just below the rank of captain. Uh, this is not the end of John Paul Jones' saga, but merely the beginning. In part two, Jones's many adventures during the Revolutionary War and his rocky final years. <laughs>